Some coax solder tips and tricks. Why do we need to learn so much stuff just to get our amateur radio license? And what's going on with Logbook of the World this time on Mailbag Monday? Well, hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to Ham Radio Tube. My name is Mike K at MRD. If you have an amateur radio related question for me, shoot me an email. I'd love to hear from you. K8MRD at iCloud.com. We've got three really interesting things to talk about this week, so let's dive right in. This first viewer writes, Hello, Mike. I watched your video and you make it look easy installing those crimp type PL connectors. Thank you. I'm sure it is. I've tried that myself and looks like my solder is the wrong kind because my soldering iron will melt it, but solder won't stick to it. So I wanted to ask which solder do I need to buy and use for installing those crimp type PL connectors? He goes on to say, this isn't the only problem I'm having with installing the connectors on coax. Also having a problem getting the inner stuff around the center wire. We call that the dielectric. Uh, this because I don't have any strength in my left hand. The hand is there, but that's about all. No grip in this hand. So this too causes problems and advice. Uh, any advice I can use to help install the PL connectors? Thanks, John K-N, K-8-N-I-V. John, thanks for writing in. Uh, I've got some tips and tricks for you, so let's hop over to the bench and I will show you. So to answer the first part of your question about solder, it's important to understand that not all solder is created equally. I am using this very old, I've had since high school, roll of Weller solder. This is a 60% tin, 40% lead solder. This is made for electrical contacts. I also have this one from Kester that uh, probably in another 30 years when this is out, I'll switch to this one. Uh, there are just straight up tin copper, which is just 100% tin, which is absolutely horrible for making electrical contacts. There's solder that they would use for like making stained glass windows and for plumbing fittings that don't have any lead. Obviously you don't want lead in your plumbing, looking at you Flint, Michigan. So you gotta have something with lead and uh, uh, tin. 60% tin, 40% lead. This is also what is known as a rosin core. And although you can't really see it, inside the middle of this solder is flux. And that's what helps solder flow properly. That sometimes isn't enough flux though. So if you're soldering and it's not flowing and you say to yourself, what the flux? Sometimes you need more flux. I like this Kester 186 soldering flux. This is just a liquid, comes with a little very fine precision point tip, uh, and you can just dab this onto whatever part you are trying to solder, and this will help the solder flow more evenly. Now, it is important to understand tip maintenance on your soldering iron. Notice, that my soldering iron is very shiny and clean. Soldering irons oxidize very, very quickly, and it's a good practice when you have the right solder. Every time you use it, meaning every time you take it out of the holder and every time you put it back in the holder, you need to tin this tip, and I like to use the little, this is kind of like a Brillo pad type thing. This is the Hako 599 Bravo. Uh, I've got a few of these things in my Amazon store if you want to look at them. But say I'm going to solder something. I'm going to remove the soldering iron from the holder. I'm going to tin the tip with solder. I'm just going to flood it with solder. And then I'm going to clean all that solder off. Then we're going to put a little bit more solder on the tip before we actually go so we have a little bit of solder to heat whatever it is we're trying to heat. Once I've completed my solder, I'm gonna flood this again with solder. I'm gonna clean it off, and then I'm gonna flood it again and put it back in its holster. And that's gonna maintain the cleanliness of the tip. Now, for your other issue about removing the dielectric from the coax, Here's a piece of LMR240 for ABR Industries, but you can save 10% using code K at MRD at ABR Industries. You can get these things. These are coax strippers, essentially. This one right here, I got for about $2 at Harbor Freight. 
I honestly have no idea where I got this one, but this is for 213, RG213. You can also do like LMR 400, Hyperflex 10, kind of any of the 10 millimeter or 400 size coaxial cables. And the way these work, these have razor blades in them. And they're just a spring-loaded contraption. This one does a few different sizes. And you're simply going to put your cable in there and let it clamp down, stick your finger in the hole, and turn, okay? And what this does is it cuts the jacket and it strips the dielectric down to the center wire. So you can see we have two cuts in this. So we can easily take off the jacket. Now, if you have problems with dexterity, maybe get some pliers and you can pull off that foam dielectric. So now there's our center pin. And then we can take this guy off because it didn't cut down to the braid and the foil inside there. And you can spread out your braid and then install your crimp connector thusly. So that would be a very good solution for you. And I hope that helps and good luck soldering. I appreciate you writing in. Thank you so much. Another thing to mention, make sure your soldering iron is good and hot. I set mine at 700 degrees, and that pretty much does everything for me. And never underestimate the power of a good vise. If you don't have any dexterity in one of your hands, use one of these. This is just a cheap vise from my favorite hardware store, Harbor Freight. It's got some rubber on it, so it doesn't uh, hurt anything that I put in it. And you can set this on the counter use this to hold the coax and do whatever you gotta do. So hopefully that helps. Thanks so much for writing in and good luck with your PL259 connectors. Next, we've got a question from a flustered viewer. He writes, hi Mike, this is me blowing off steam. I got my technician license two years ago and it took me almost six months of studying to get it. I'm now struggling to study for my general license. Here's my dilemma. I have absolutely no interest in learning how to build antennas or radios. I have no interest in the theory behind all of that. Yes, as a new tech, I built a tape measure Yagi Uda. Uh, I also built a J-Pole. Neither one of them came out very well, nor did they work very well. And I ended up buying an Aero Yagi for satellite use and another J-Pole antenna made by somebody else. I am not the mechanical type person. I just wanted to make contacts. I want to learn what bands I can and cannot use and how much power I am allowed to use. I am a good boy and stay within those parameters. What do I need? To, why do I need to learn all that extra stuff that I will never ever use just to talk on the radio? I'm sure I'm not the only person that has ever felt this way, uh, yet I feel that I am. Henry's Pico Farad's Capacitant Hat, insert peanuts reference here, wah, 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 wah. Why can't there be a classification of licenses for people who just want to talk on the radio? Have fun with this, my friend. If nothing else, it's a great laugh. And thank you for your wonderful inspiration and everything you do for the community. So that last sentence leads me to believe that I, I don't know if this is a, a serious question or not, but let's, let's answer that last question first. Why can't there be a classification of licenses for people who just want to talk on the radio? So there are. There's CB. You don't need a license for that. There's FRS. You don't use a license for that. There's GMRS. You need a license for that, but you just pay money. There's no test or anything. So I don't, I don't want to say ham radio is not right for you uh, because I think ham radio is right for everybody, but there's different. Everybody gets something different out of ham radio. And the reason we need to learn all that stuff is because ham radio is a licensed radio service. And, and at the heart of it is about experimentation. And yeah, there's all the whole goodwill and all that stuff, but it's, it's about experimentation. All of the, the, the different tiers of license classes are basically just giving you a very brief introduction to all of the different theories that go on in electronics and RF and everything, so you at least know the terms, okay? When I studied for technician, did I know what they were talking about? No. When I studied for general, did I know everything they were talking about? No. When I studied for extra, did I know everything they were talking about? No. I still don't know. 
But having that foundation, if you will, is why it's important to understand those. Like, I don't care about a NAND, NOR, and an AND gate at all. I'll probably never use those in my life, much like I probably will never use algebra, something that I said back in high school and something that's still true to this day, but I also really, really suck at math. So it's, it's, it's about the heart of ham radio, experimenting, finding out what makes things tick and trying them. I've always been into science. I wasn't the greatest student, but I was the kid that would take apart my walkie-talkies and my electronic devices to see what was inside of them and hopefully put them back together without any spare parts. So, you know, that's that just is amateur radio. Now, there's nothing wrong with you getting your license, buying your radios, buying your antennas, never building anything. If you just want to make contacts, that's fine. I get it. But there's more to it than that. And there's a lot there's a lot of smart people in this hobby, a lot of uh, electrical engineers, software engineers, computer people, all things that I am not. I'm a dumb sales guy, okay? And I can still figure it out. But I love antennas. The fan dipole was the first thing that I ever made. And I loved it. And I had it up in my house for a couple of years and I made contacts all over the world. You don't need to spend all this money on fancy equipment. You can make antennas without analyzers. Do they help? Yes, they do. But I made, uh, I did a video on a 10 meter dipole uh, out of speaker wire and some cutting board that I tuned with my Yesu 818 just looking at the SWR meter. I didn't even bring an analyzer out there and it costs under $10. So there, there's a lot of theory in what we do and there's a lot of reasoning and understanding uh, as to why we need to understand some of these theories so we're not just causing interference to our fellow ham that, you know so and as far as learning about what power you can use and what bands you can and cannot use well that's all part of the curriculum you as a technician should have already studied that part and know what parts of the bands you can use and what power levels you can't and if you don't remember that, which is very common, don't feel bad about that, there's the ARRL band plan that you can download and look and see what bands and portions of the band and what power you can and cannot use with your license class. It's all there for you. You just got to want to know it. Uh, I don't know. Guys, leave some comments. What do you think? Uh, <laughs> that's, a, that's a tough one to go down, but I'm glad you're here. We are glad you're here. Don't stop. Get your general. Study it. Even if you forget 99% of it, you're still going to learn something from it, and that might pique your interest to want to learn more. And if not, that's fine. You can sit in your shack and make contacts all day long. So anyway, I hope you have fun, and welcome to Amateur Radio. Thanks for writing in. Lastly, we've got a question about the good old ARRL. Let's take a look. So this viewer is writing, hi Mike, hopefully this will be resolved soon, but just in case it isn't, could you discuss the problem at Logbook of the World where we can't upload our logs? Apparently they had some kind of attack and outage and some features are back and others aren't. It might be an interesting topic for your viewers. I noticed this because I got a failure when trying to upload contacts for Rumlog Best Scott. Scott, thanks for writing in. So unless you've been living under a rock, you've probably heard that the ARRL has been uh, cyber attacked. The, their phones were down, logbook of the world is down, uh, all kinds of services were down. Now, we can sit here and criticize logbook of the world or, and the ARRL for, for whatever reason you want, whatever, whatever feelings you have for them or against them, and it's irrelevant, okay? I think it's important to stay positive in, in this situation because anybody can be cyber attacked. This time it just happened to happen to the ARRL. What I do know is they are keeping people updated, so if we hop over to the internet machine, they're keeping us updated. This is from 6-6, so just, just a couple days ago. We're aware that certain members believe we should be openly communicating everything associated with this incident. Well, there's your transparency. They're working with industry experts, including cybercrime attorneys, blah, blah, blah. Membership wasn't impacted. You can, you, can, you can still go give them their money. 
Digital edition of QST is still available. Uh, Air of uh, VECs, this is important. Uh, they're processing their licenses. Uh, the applications received from VEs who completed candidate exam sessions as of June 6th. Their staff is processing applications from forms given on May 22nd. So they're a little backed up. I mean, give the guys some slack. Uh, you know, stuff happens. Uh, let's see. The memorial station is fully operational with voice CW and digital bulletins, code practice, all that stuff. Um, the station continues to welcome visiting uh, operators during normal hours. Online log submissions will be supported as usual for the VHF contest uh, and the publication of the most ARRL e-newsletters has resumed with minimal disruption to regular schedules. So the incident was extensive and categorized by the FBI as unique, compromising network devices, servers, cloud-based systems, and PCs. ARRL man ma uh, management quickly established an incident response team. This has led to an extensive effort to, re to, I can't read, contain and remediate the networks, restore servers, and staff are beginning to the testing of applications and interfaces to ensure proper operation. Thank you for your patience. I think that's important right there. So what does this mean for us? I can only speak for myself, but at the end of the day, I don't care. I really don't care if Logbook of the World is down. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do exactly what I have been doing and waiting. Here's my log, okay? I've got all these, see this L-O-W, see all these W's here? That means I've worked them but have not submitted my logs to Logbook of the World. And there's a lot of them, okay? It's going to be okay. They're going to be back eventually. And when they are, I'm going to hit the upload to Logbook of the World button and I'll have my confirmed QSOs. Because at the end of the day, it's just a ham radio contact. They mean literally nothing. So my advice to everyone, stay positive. Whatever your feelings are on the ARRL uh, are irrelevant. They got attacked. And I would encourage everyone to support the ARRL. Whether or not you like everything they're doing, I, I don't think anybody likes everything they're doing. But one thing that's very, very important is our spectrum defense. And those guys are on the front lines defending our frequency allocations. They're the only ones. So that alone is kind of reason to support the ARRL. Just be patient. It will come back. You think anybody at the ARRL is happy that this happened? I can only imagine the workload on all of the employees that this is causing on top of their regular daily duties. This has to suck for them. And hearing a bunch of YouTubers bitch about it and complain about the ARRL isn't going to help anything. Let's come together as a community and support the ARRL in, in, in this time of need. That's what I got to say about it. So thank you for writing in. Guys, if you have amateur radio related questions for me, shoot me an email, k8mrd at icloud.com. My name is Mike, k8mrd. Thanks so much for watching Ham Radio Tube 73.